Hello everyone, my name is Alice Ball and I run the membership group at scrapheavy.org and I am so excited to welcome you to this special bonus session. So recently I hosted the Scrap Smarter Experience and we had 10 amazing teachers plus an inspiring keynote speaker and it was amazing. We loved it. It was so much fun. Replays will be available like really soon. It was going to be today. It's not going to be today, but pro probably tomorrow. Um, but and like the replays of the sessions are available, but replay in case you missed it, that's going to be available. Um, what we did during the event is we had 10 classes and each class focused on some cool scrappy skill that we could add to our arsenal to help make our scrapbooking a little bit more fun and help us make pages that we love. And one of our teachers was my friend Misty Murphy and Misty showed us some watercolor play. So before I bring Misty on, I just have to show you the little tiny sneak peek at her introduction to the Scrap Smarter experience. So I'm gonna show you this. Um, share sound, yeah, that would be helpful. Hello everyone, I am happy to be here. Let me introduce myself. My name is Misty. I'm not an artist, but I am artful and I love watercolor. So let's go ahead and play. I know every- Okay, so that's it. I'm just giving you a little sneak peek. Some of you were with us for the event. If you weren't, that's just like a little start of what you might have missed during the event and i think that um as we did the class it was amazing so misty walked us through materials the supplies how to get the look that we want and how to kind of go about playing with our supplies and trust me there was a few times where we were all like okay i totally didn't know that and um i think that watercolor is a super fun way to add stuff to your pages misty would you like to Tell us a little bit more about what you've been thinking about since that class and what we're going to talk about today. Sure. Um, I guess let's start. When we did that class, I didn't have a lot of chance to show you some layouts that put watercolor to use. So I pulled out a stack and I'd like to go ahead and show you those as we get started. And then we'll dive into some of the um, tips. And I did print out, this was available through the class. Let's see, I have the wrong view here. I've got tech so that I can do this. Okay, so this is the printout that I had available for the class and the first side shows all of uh, the supplies. But then on the second side, it went through the different points that I made in the video. So I'm going to use this as we work through things today. And I've made a few notes on things to be sure of. So and if you have any questions, go ahead and pop them in the chat because Alice will be looking into that and, and, and posing questions to me as we go along. So that's the basics about what to expect ask, for today. If you today. have a question, type the word question in all caps and then uh, ask your question. And that way I'll be able to see it really easily in the chat so that we can make sure that we get your questions asked. Right. So this is my first live. I'm a little bit nervous, but I'm doing okay. So if, if anything goes wrong, just let me or Alice know and we'll try and get it fixed. Okay. Do you want me to go ahead and dive in? Go ahead. Okay. So here is my stack of layouts. I'll just go through them pretty quickly. Let's make sure I'm in, in the shot there. There we go. So that's the one that you saw in um, my intro, and this incorporated a lot of the techniques that I did through the class. So we're gonna talk about dripping today. We're gonna to talk about doing some frames and kind of blending out to get a feathered edge. I'm not gonna go into painting little images today probably, um, but we can talk about some uh, lettering if we want to. We can talk about um, doing shapes and different blends that you can get. So that is a lot of the stuff we're going to cover. And then if we think about layouts, um, there are different ways to add watercolor to your layout. So this one was just some very small blending and splattering. And then I had done the same thing on a separate piece. 
and die cut some letters. So that's a way. This one I just cut out a separate piece and just did some general color wash. And that's a simple way. This one I did some big swaths of color and then I splattered so that you can get these interesting textures in there. This one again, big swath of color and I splattered more color on top and it gives these blooms of color. When you do wet paint on top of already wet paint, it can give you some interesting textures. You can use big bold shapes and watercolor them in as backgrounds to papers. One thing I didn't cover in the class is a lot of watercolor paper is not 12 by 12. So I often will use a uh, common size is nine by 12 and I will cut that down to nine by nine and then mat it on top of a larger piece. So that is one thing to keep in mind when you're watercoloring. Um, sometimes I will use um, the Vicki Booten mixed media paper to do things on top of and as long as it's not too wet, you should be okay like this dripping technique. Um, and this one was kind of interesting because you notice the drips go up, but all I did was start my my watercolor here and then let it drip this way. And then that became my layout once I turned it around so the drips don't actually go up unless you do something to get them to do that. Here's one where we talked about um, masking with washi tape. And so this one, I created a plaid with some masking. This one, I painted a little scene and we did talk about water in the class. And then I did some lettering. So those are things that you can do. This one incorporates more drips. And then I've got kind of a bokeh effect going on here with these hexagon shapes. So you can do some fun backgrounds. This one, now I did um, stamp and paint all of this, but if you had a pre-printed sheet of paper, you can just add splotches of watercolor to highlight different zones. And then this one was just a very free flowing, just playing with, with color. All right, so any questions so far? I'm not seeing anything okay. uh, mentioned yet. However, the, the the when you said swaths of color, like that was like <laughs> that's just a nice phrase, by the way. It's, um, I really like the smush. tip where you cut down the watercolor paper because you didn't have like twelve by twelve in some yeah. situations, and you cut that down and just kind of centered that onto your other background paper. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it kind of just makes you look at your supplies in a different way like some of the other paper is maybe 12 inches or more one way but maybe not 12 the other way and exactly different ways of playing with it and i think we look at it we're like oh i don't have 12 by 12 if that's your preferred size of course if you if it's not then that's fine but if that's your preferred size i think that becomes like we, we let things like that get in the way and become a barrier to us going ahead with it and just playing with it and trying. But what you showed us there with that nine by nine square in the middle of the sheet was totally perfect. And we've yeah. all made pages with a border before. Yeah, and I want to like reverse that idea too, that if you're not a 12 by 12 scrapbooker, you can certainly use smaller pieces of paper. And a lot of my class use journal card size, three by four cards. So you can start with smaller canvases and then do pocket pages or layer those on top of whatever size, traveler's notebooks, whatever size that you use. So watercolor is very flexible that way. Well, and if you're making like a smaller piece and then you use it for like layers behind your photo or something, those layers don't have to be as perfect like as we're learning as we're playing <laughs> and trying all of this stuff if they're not that perfect and they're kind of mostly hiding just adding a little bit of color it's kind of great Thank yeah definitely question how did you use duct tape to make the plaids and doesn't it stick to the paper okay it wasn't duct tape so just just so you know i used washi tape you could also use painter's tape and what i do I didn't bring any washi tape out. What I do is I unroll the washi tape or painter's tape and then I will stick it down to my pants a couple of times to help detack it a little bit. The fuzz from your clothes sticks to it and kind of makes it less tacky. And then I'll tape it down in different shapes, patterns. You could do random, you could do rows, whatever you want to do. And then wherever the washi tape is covering your paper, the paint won't soak into it. 
that. Yeah, and Deborah has said the same thing. She says, that's great because I have some four by six watercolor paper. So then it's a chance to like dive in and play with it and think about how you can actually put that into your scrapbooks. But, you know, you yeah, you could definitely make yourself layers and make a row across of different layers and kind of um, twist them and turn them and then use that as the base of your layout. So there's lots of ways you can add pieces in there. Yeah, Vicky says, thanks. I came in late and I thought I heard duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> no, that would be a whole mess. <laughs> we don't want to go there. It might tear up the paper. I'm just thinking. Yeah, just a little. So part of what I had planned for tonight is if you all have some supplies handy, whatever kind of paper you're going to use. And in the class, I did talk about if you don't have a paint palette, you can use uh, markers and such. So whatever kind of coloring products, paintbrushes, water, if you want to play along with me, we can we can do it that way. Okay. I'm gonna turn my notes around here so I can see them as we work. I have a terrible memory, so I have to keep my notes here. <laughs> so I guess the first thing we can do is talk about water. So I like to have two cups of water because I'll keep one for washing dirty brushes and then one for clean water for doing techniques. And if you want to add some water to your paper, and I'm using a really big brush, but you guys don't have to. And then you guys can kind of look at it and see the sheen of water on your paper and you can see where it's more puddly and less puddly. And oh, the camera's picking it up just a little bit. I didn't think it would. There you can. Yeah, kind of see the sheen. You kind of see a little shiny spot. Yeah, and if you take some color, oh, I didn't wet my palette before we got started. Um, you can just use your paintbrush to wet it, but because I tend to get into all the colors, I'll just use a spray bottle to wet everything. And it doesn't take too much to, to rehydrate. Let's go with a nice bold color that you guys will be able to see. And if I add some color to that wet spot, do you see how it flows? into the water on the paper. So the bigger you're gonna make, let's see, if I leave my brush a little bit pink, you guys can maybe see it just a little bit better. The bigger you make your wet area, the more room that spot will have to flow out and it will come to a natural stop. Now you can see this one kind of hit the edge of where the, the water stopped and it started to curl around the edge. So that will limit um, the feathery edges if you're trying to get a nice pretty feathery edge. This one has more room to just keep going until the water in the paint has been kind of used up, I guess is a way to say it. And it will just be a complete feathery edge around there. Do you have a favorite size of brush? Um, I use this one a lot. This is probably the biggest size I use. These are probably the four I use the most. So I have a large flat, I have a smaller flat, and then I have a large round and a smaller round. And this is what a 16. Brushes have numbers to them and the bigger the number, the bigger the brush. So this is a 16 and this is so eight, lots of brushes have numbers. I, I managed to find that my favorite brushes don't have any numbers on them. And I'm like, well, that's not helpful. <laughs> then you just go by looking at them. I want a bigger brush. I'll choose the bigger brush. So that works too. All right, so that is kind of the beginning of flow. If you like that very flowy watercolor look. And if we're doing my that that word swath if we're doing a big swath of color I usually like to give myself a big area and this is where the big brushes come in handy I'm gonna make sure I stay in screen and then I'll give myself some colors and I'm gonna work a lot with the primary colors because that way you guys can see that even with just three colors you can oops, you can get a lot of um, cool play out of your colors. Where I overlap this red and blue, it's gonna give me more purple. And then I can kind of clean my brush off a little bit and go back into the red so I get a more true red. And then if I go into my yellow and I overlap, I can get some orange. 
And then if I clean my brush and get more yellow, I can get myself into a more true yellow. And you can see how you've got a rainbow going on and you can use that as the background to a photo, just like a photo mat, or you can do your whole page that way. So that's a fun way to use this kind of same flow to give yourself um, Personally, I think this is one of my favorite things to do for a background because it lets me feel like I'm being creative and it gives me the chance to play. And because it's going in the background, like any parts that I feel are imperfect or not quite right are mostly getting covered up by other pictures and stuff. So yeah. it's a really good way to kind of test and play and be like, okay, well, cool. I made a little background or a little like spot, like, um, almost like a little home spot uh, for my clustering or my layers to kind of sit. Mm -hmm, exactly. And the what because this is called wet on wet technique, um, you're adding wet paint onto a wet paper. Um, it will dry in some unexpected ways. You can't control it. That's one of the things about watercolor. You have to just be okay with it doing its thing. So you can see I'm getting some more red that found a water channel and it's flowing. Well, can you see it? Oh, I guess you can. It's mm -hmm. kind of flowing up that way. Mm -hmm. um, so you have a little bit of unpredictability to it. That's, that's what I like about it actually. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, so that's some flow. Now you can do what's called wet on dry where you just leave your paper dry and maybe I'll, let's see, I'll work that way. So if I do the same thing and I start, I'll start with blue actually. So if I start with some blue here and actually I've got a little too much water. So that's one of the things the class talked about is a little bit of water control. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of soak up a little bit of this water. And if you scrape your paintbrush on the edge of your um, cup as you're painting, that'll help squeeze out a little bit excess water. Okay, so now I've got so this. One thing I haven't seen is like, do you, you've got like a cloth or something? It's just off the side there? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. so I just keep a rag and a lot of the times I'll touch my paintbrush to the rag to help take away to the, the excess water. Mm -hmm. And I might get into some other, other techniques that I do with that too. So while my paint is still wet, I have a little bit of chance to come in here and blend. Now, if your paint has started to dry, and maybe I'll do this up here, um, I'll come back to that swatch here in just a minute and show you some mistakes that can happen if your paint has started to dry. Now you can see it's blending a little bit, but we're not getting the same color variation that we did up there with the wet on wet technique. So the water, is your friend and it helps flow the colors. Now, because my red was wetter than the blue, I am getting a better blend with the yellow. So this, when you're painting wet on dry, you have a little bit more control over, over the, the paint and where it's gonna go. And, and you might, if you don't like these feathery edges and you want a nice smooth edge, then using the wet paint on a dry piece of paper is going to give you more control over what the paint does. All right, so that's some of the basics. Oh, let's come back to our splotch before I forget. So if I were to come in and try and start painting over this paint that has started to dry a little bit, can you guys see what's happening there? That is called a back run or a cauliflower. Sometimes it's called a bloom. And if you like that effect, you can play with the paint and get that. But if you want very smooth um, paint, you're gonna have to be careful about keeping your paint wet because if it starts to dry and then you add more wet paint on top of it, that water pushes the pigment around and you'll get weird textures. Okay, are we doing okay? 
Well, and then, you know, sometimes you do this thing and then you're like, oh, well, actually, that's kind of cool because I've created this, you know, like all these extra kind of dark spots and light spots. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes I'll come in. Let's see this. If this one is still wet. Unexpected enough. things that are mistakes. And sometimes you're like, well, yeah. it's, it's, it's so, okay. It's kind of so cool. <laughs> sometimes I'll come in and I'll splatter and you guys can see the, the paint is starting to react there. I'll spatter either, you can use um, a color to spatter. Let's go ahead and add some blue spatters. Let's see if I can get it wet enough. So you can add colored spatters and that will start to push the paint around and give you different textures. But if you use um, clean water, you can get those back runs going on in there and it adds really interesting texture it's that's fun for if you want to paint a watery scene or something like that you can get some cool textures i think it says i've had that bloom lots when i didn't want it <laughs> but yeah. now you'll know a little bit more about how to prevent that from happening yeah. it so did take me a long time to figure that out and a lot of the stuff I kind of figured out through experimenting, but there are, you know, there have been a few YouTube channels that I've watched to get tips and tricks. So, and I took, I took one watercolor class a few years ago. Speaking of that, you actually gave me a link to uh, a YouTuber that does watercolor. And you said that like, yes. it does, she's like slightly like ahead of you, but she's not like so artistic that it's like, overwhelming when you're trying to watch her stuff you're like oh my god I can't do that at all right she is very approachable um I don't believe she's a scrapbooker at all she's about teaching people to paint images and things but she tells you a lot about the behavior of watercolor so she's very approachable in terms of learning how to control the paint and her name is Emma Lefebvre and I just posted her link in the chat here and yeah. we'll make sure that that's available on the replay as well Okay, let's see. What were some of the other things we talked about? So we did talk about brush strokes. So this is where different um, brushes can come in handy. And this nice big brush will kind of demonstrate that in a good way. So this brush is called a round brush and that's because this metal piece is round. It's not because the tip of the brush is round and that was something I didn't understand when I first started. A lot of watercolor paintbrush will actually have a pointy tip so that you can get different textures. So you can get these tiny lines. If you push down, you can get loops and you can lift up and get tiny lines. So you can use your paintbrush to get some fun textures. You could do this as a border or that, you know, this looks a lot like the streamers. You could do this for the background of a birthday photo and make some streamers on the back of your layout. Uh, Diane saying, can you show us how to frame around a picture? Sure. Yep. Let me grab a clean sheet of paper. So while she's grabbing that, I'm going to show you just like the simplest thing I did when I started playing with watercolor and I'll just put my screen up on an added spotlight and then I'll take it away once Misty is going. But this is a, a little notebook that I was working in and you'll see like I drew a line around the edge of the page and each month I switched colors so that I had a different line around the edge of the page depending on the month and for me just had to have that little touch of color just made it so cute I did like a little um black line around it too to kind of hold it in but I think that that was like the simplest thing I could do and literally it's running the brush around seeing how the color goes from dark to light as I re like add more color to it. I just thought it was super easy. If you're like, oh, okay, like I need something that's gonna be extra easy. Give me like ultra easy. That was it. <laughs> yes. And I think you brought up a good point that I didn't necessarily cover. When you um, get paint into your brush, that's called loading your brush. And as you paint, let, let me go this way and give myself lots of room. As you paint, your brush will run out of color 
and the red is nice and dark. But can you see that this is much darker? I don't know if it's picking up on the video so well. This is much darker where I started than over here where it's much lighter. So if you want a nice even um, color, you're going to have to make sure you're loading up your brush as you do your paint strokes. Okay, let's get back to somebody asked about doing a frame around a photo. So I have this photo that I'm working on for a, a video on Friday. I am a YouTuber, so um, I'm sure Alice can probably put my YouTube channel up in the links. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this photo will be featured in my video on Friday. So when I'm working with photos straight on my watercolor paper, I'll tend to give myself a little bit of a mark or a line with pencil so that I know where I need to paint. Is that showing up? It is showing up. And then depending on the kind of border you want, you might just want to do a straight edge border just like that. But one of the fun borders that I like to do, and I'll use my flat here for this, is I will wet my paper and I will give myself a nice wide wet swath there. I think that's my favorite word when I'm talking about watercolor. I will give myself nice and wet. So I do say nice and wet, but I should warn you that if you have big puddles on your paper, that could cause those cauliflowers. So while you want it to be plenty wet, you don't necessarily want it to be unevenly wet. You want to have a nice sheen on your paper without too many big puddles. Okay, so I've got, and then as you're working, like I started up here, this will start to dry. So as I get all the way around the paper, I will come in and then make sure everything has gotten re-wetted so that it hasn't dried on me as I've been going around. And then I will pick up my color and I will just add it in to this edge. And if it's not flowing enough, I will use a somewhat dry brush to come in and kind of encourage it to flow a little bit more. And if I want to change colors, I can come in and kind of go over where I was working. And then I want to encourage this to blend a little bit more. So I'm going to actually, there's a little bit too much water here. I'm going to kind of soak that up a little bit. I'm going to encourage that blend. And then I'll grab my yellow and get some of the green to blend. And sometimes I'll just kind of tap little bits of color in there. And that helps kind of the, grady, the gradient to happen if I just add small amounts and then work my way out towards um, more true color. And you can see how feathery this is getting as, as I'm moving over here because that water is pulling the pigment around. Let's see, I'll just go into an actual orange. Too much orange in my brush, it was hard to get it clean. So Kathleen's asking what kind of watercolor paper that you're using. This is Strathmore watercolor paper that I've got going on here. Um, for scrapbooking, I find that it's fine. Um, Strathmore is not, well, this is the yellow package Strathmore. They, they number their papers and I believe the yellow package is the 300 series, which is kind of their um, lowest no, it's not the lowest. It's like kind of their beginner watercolor paper. And it's a little bit, oh, how do I say this? It, it behaves differently than some of their higher end paper. Um, I find that this paper tends to puddle up more, so it's harder to avoid some of those cauliflowers. But if you if you learn to kind of soap, soak up your puddles so that you don't get too much, it, it works okay. I know, let's see, this is the brand 
that a lot of watercolor artists use. Um, it's very high quality. And what I just learned actually is that most of the high quality watercolor paper is made out of cotton and not out of you know, wood fibers. So yes, I just use Strathmore most of the time because it's really affordable and because I can play. And if I make something that I don't like, I can recycle it or I keep a bin on the floor right next to me where I'll just throw in pieces that I didn't like and I'll punch shapes and stuff out of them later to use on projects. And actually, if we go back to the original piece that I had in the class, I've punched circles, I've punched hearts, I've done border punches, and these were all just scraps of watercolor paper that I had lying around. So we've got a photo border going on here. Did that answer the question? Yeah, and I think so. And but there's also the question was, is the Vicki Booten foundation paper okay for watercolor? Um, I do watercolor on that. And let's see if one of these, I know I did one of these on the foundations. Um, if you use two, like if you do really, really wet techniques, it, um, it will buckle more and it, it could start pilling on you, which means little chunks of the paper start um, kind of tearing up, but I've had pretty good luck with it. So I, yeah, for a lot of scrapbooking, I'd say that paper's okay. It's hard to find right now. It's been out of stock a lot of places. So if you can find it or if you already have it, um, yeah, I'd say go for it. The paper that I use is a, the, from Prima. It's a Prima 12 by 12 watercolor paper pad. It's acid lignin free. It has 20 sheets in a pack. I get it from scrapbook.com usually, and I found the link for it. It's in my affiliate link, but um, it's, I like working with it. It's like a nice, it has a good tooth. It's not like super smooth or anything. So this is what the paper pad looks like. Um, but my only complaint is that they actually like glue both of the ends of the pad. So you kind of have to loosen off one side before you can loosen off the other, but you know, you get used to doing that and then it's fine. But that's my preferred one that I've done most of my stuff because I like, I want it to feather and bleed. Like what, she, what Misty's showing, she's like when she's getting the colors to really spread and I don't want it to warp too much. And I find that this one is my preferred one. Kathleen says, thank you. I hear cold pressed and other things. And as a beginner, I just want to know what to start with. Yes. Um, if <laughs> you buy a, today. <laughs> so let me give you the things. If you buy a pad of paper and I'll pull this one out. Ugh. So this is what I'm using in a smaller size. This is the Strathmore 300 series. This you can find just about everywhere, you know, Walmart, Target, um, I find it at my grocery store. So you can find this a lot of places. It's really affordable. If you are looking for paper, find one that says watercolor. Most watercolor paper is going to have a weight listed on it. And most watercolor paper is 140 pounds. So as long as it says 140 pounds or a bigger number, you'll be fine. And then cold press. So, um, I won't go into it a whole lot, but hot press watercolor paper is not the same creature. <laughs> so if you find that it says cold press and it's, you actually have to kind of search out the hot press watercolor paper. So you're unlikely to just make a mistake, but just in case, if it says cold press, then you know you've got, and that kind of brings me to a point that Alice mentioned. She talked about the tooth of the paper. And what that is, is watercolor paper has a texture to it. And every manufacturer's texture is going to be slightly different. And watercolor paper has a bit of a rough texture. And that helps create channels for the water to flow and to kind of absorb into the paper and do its thing. Um, a lot of paper has two sides to it. So one side will have more texture and tooth to it and the back side will be slightly different. And Strathmore is definitely true to that. So if you like to stamp and then watercolor in little uh, stamped images, you, you could get off with using the back side of the Strathmore because it's smoother. 
So if, while we're talking about this, because of the tooth, because of that texture, sometimes it can be hard to stick your elements and get them to stick to the watercolor paper. Like if you're adding stickers, thickers, well, we know they don't stick to anything. You're, you're using liquid anyway. glue with those. That doesn't even count. But yeah. like with your other elements, even adding your photos. So what kind of adhesives are you using? I use my ATG gun. I think most people probably know what this beast looks like at this point. And as long as I add, you know, at least two long strips, like on the back of a photo, I'm not going to set it in my wet paint. I'll add two long strips and that's usually enough. And if I'm having trouble, I just bust out the liquid glue and that works for me. But I've used glue dots and I have luck with those. So I, I usually don't have a problem with things falling off, although those thicker elements, <laughs> your, your thicker yeah, letters and stuff. I, they, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I use the sequing that paper tape, like the paper tape rolls. I think that they're a really good compromise for using when I'm using the watercolor paper because I think that they stick better. Like my preferred um, like adhesive is like a glue dots. Um, tape runner glue dots makes a tape runner by the way and I really like it so anybody that wants to try a new one use the glue dots one because I want them to make it forever and ever so very self-serving <laughs> shout out there but um yeah the paper tape is the one that I tend to reach for when I'm doing work on watercolor paper just thought we better mention that because it can be a little bit trickier because your pieces don't want to stick with that texture yeah that's a good point to bring up I hadn't even thought about all right, so um, if, if there are other questions, go ahead and throw them in there. Otherwise, I'll kind of show a few more things and we can move on. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any more questions yet. Okay. But like, okay. have at it, like everybody right. care. But... So another thing I talked about in, in the video was doing ombre effects. And I'm just gonna use the center of this paper here. So an ombre is um, a color that fades either from light or from dark to light or from one color to another color. And that's more of a blend than an ombre in my opinion, but some people use that word there. Um, so if I, I think I'm gonna just stick with the red cause it's so easy to see on the camera. So if I start painting with my wet paint and then I dip into the water and I, I kind of squeeze a little bit of the water off on my on the side of my um, water cup over here and then I dip again I'm not getting any more paint I'm just getting more water as I go with this and I'm just diluting this paint as we go to create an ombre effect so that's kind of a fun thing that you can do on a big background, you can create an ombre from the top or the bottom or from the side and give yourself some beautiful color that way. So that is another technique. Let's see. I'm gonna pull in the paper that we started with earlier that's dry already. So another thing that we talked about, and we talked about this specifically when I was mentioning the, um, was that? No, it was, it was a separate one, sorry my brain somewhere else. Okay, so I've got this dry yellow paint. And one of the things about watercolor is that it is a, a transparent paint. So acrylic paints and things like that, they're going to cover up whatever you put them on top of. Watercolor paint, you can see through it. And there's some caveats there to different brands and colors of paint. But in general, the watercolor paint you're going to be able to see through. So if I add a color on top of another dry color, that's called glazing. Um, let's see if we can get it. The red is super strong. Let me try it with a blue or let me dilute my red a little bit and get a more of a pink to dilute. So if I cover this up, you can kind of see a little bit of orange coming through where it's overlapped. So you can see out here where, making sure I'm on screen, out here where it's more pink and then in here 
it's definitely got some orange to it. So if you layer colors on top of each other, you can get a lot more depth of color and texture um, just by layering things together. And so that's called glazing. And you wanna do that when your paint is dry and you'll paint stuff on top of it. One of the things that I like to do here, I'm just gonna use the back side of this one because it's already dry. One of the things that I like to do, and we'll come back to this piece, is to just do these big, these big blocks of color. And I kind of like to leave some white space in here. And when you're painting images, there's definitely reasons you want to leave white space. But if you're just doing this abstract coloring, the white space kind of helps give it more movement and texture as opposed to a full um, sheet of color. So if you leave some white space and just be really loose with it, you'll get a different feeling to your piece. Um, Nicole's asking about how long do you let the paper dry with different techniques before you add your pictures and embellishments? I'm assuming like 24 hours or something. Yeah, um, I do use a heat gun <laughs> to help speed things up because I'm very impatient. Uh, that's one of the things that was really hard for me with watercolor in the beginning because I hate waiting for things to dry. Um, so I will hit some of these with a heat gun. Now, if you've got big puddles that can cause more of those blooms to happen because it pushes the water and wherever the water is thickest, wettest, <laughs> um, it's gonna carry the pigment with it. So if you've got puddles, you're gonna um, concentrate your color and we'll see this one as it dries because I'm seeing a puddle is starting right here. So if something is most of the way dry, like this one is most of the way dry, I will hit it with a heat gun to speed it up so I can keep working. But usually when I'm done with a piece, I'll leave it overnight and then come back and put all of the rest of my stuff on top of it. You are so much more patient than I am because I'm like, <laughs> well, it'll be dry soon. And then like I start building my layout in front of me. And usually by the time that I have <laughs> you know, like actually designing the rest of my page, I'm like, I think that's pretty dry. Yeah, <laughs> I've ruined photos, time. putting a photo on top of paint that was still too wet. So <laughs> if your paint is too wet, you can, you, you can find yourself in I will say I'm place. in a very dry climate. Like Alberta, we are landlocked. We are in the middle of winter right now. My skin is dried out. My paper will dry out. Everything will dry out. You can't leave the bread bag open because that will dry out. Like, <laughs> Yeah. And my climate is wet. So I live in the Pacific Northwest. I know somebody here said they were from Washington State. Um, I'm in Washington State and it rains a lot here. So our climate is wet. And that's the only climate I know how to paint in because <laughs> I've never painted anywhere else. But yeah, I know that if you're in a drier climate, um, things are going to dry on you faster. So I'm just gonna pop in for a sec with my camera and I'm gonna show just super simple, right? Like she's gonna show you how to do the cool stuff. I'm just showing you simple things. So this is a little book that I made when I did traveling actually to Denver, Colorado and we made little books and I made this little journal. Now this is a watercolor paper but it was like a really um, smooth watercolor paper. I think it was maybe from close to my heart or Stampin' Up, I can't remember. It was from some um, like home party kind of company. And you can see the colored background papers. I just literally went shush, 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 and smushed wa like watercolor over my, my backgrounds. And so then when I put the book together with this paper, I just think it's so pretty to like walk through all these pages that are like, well, it's like a little rainbow, right? I set it up all in like little rainbow colors. So you kind of go through the rainbow as you go through the little book um, from my trip. And it's kind of something that I like, I enjoyed it so much in that one that I've done it again. And I just smushed all of my color all over the background. And you can see I'm doing, I'm playing as I go. It's like, how can I get my colors to blend a little bit, but not too much so that you still see all the colors. And it's just that chance to kind of play and create, there's some stamps, there's some like little things in here. But I think um, 
you know, you can try the techniques that Misty's showing us, but like know that it can be super simple and still get really good looks. So don't worry yeah. about like not being good at it. You don't have like, to be this good This isn't to do hard. That. You, you can don't just have to be good to do that. Paint, <laughs> I know. Just swoosh paint. And for me, I just love to, I told somebody today in a comment on Instagram, I love to experience color. I just sit there <laughs> and soak it in because it is so pretty. So just swoosh paint and play and, and don't panic. <laughs> it's recyclable. And if you get the Strathmore paper, it's affordable. So yeah, you can just play. Uh, Diane's asking, will using ink from refill bottles work? Have you tried yes. that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I will use something like, I'll use something like um, a stamping block, or I actually have this little plastic palette, or you can use just a sheet of plastic with a piece of white cardstock in it, like a, a packaging from, you know, a product that you might throw away, and you can drip your, um, Reinkers onto there and pick it up with your paintbrush and paint. Yep. That's actually how I use the markers. I'm just going to share this really quick because I don't know. We didn't talk about the, the watercolor markers that are out there. So I have a couple sets. I have the Vicki Booten ones and I have these Jane Davenport ones. And I really like them. They are intense color. So very intense, but using them straight from the brush is super intense like i have a sample layout where i did just straight with pretty much no water <laughs> like straight from there onto the paper they're like really vibrant but to actually get the watercolor effect i put some of the drips from that onto the craft sheet or whatever and then i use watercolor with a separate brush to actually play with them. So that's just my tip there. If you've picked up some of these, cause you're like, oh my gosh, Vicki Booten makes the watercolor markers. That's gonna be the best thing ever. Just know like that might be really intense and you might not wanna use that as your paintbrush. So put it onto your surface and use it just like a palette. Yeah, I can show you guys. So if you've got a stamp block or I'll do my palette since it's white, you can use ink pads too. If you just smush, make sure I'm in screen. If you just smush your ink pad onto a palette and then you can you can pick up your color and I will kind of dilute it off to the side a little bit till I've got a, a puddle of color and then I will start adding it to my project. And then if I need it to be more intense of a color, I'll pick up some of the drier ink and just add it to my project. So yeah, you can use all the things. You could scribble on here with a plain uh, water-based marker. You can use those, you know, watercolor markers that Alice was talking about, ink pads, ink refillers, all of that stuff. Gelatos, if anybody has gelatos in their stash, all of it, yeah. The Vicky Boot and Crayons. Like yeah, Vicky Boot and crayons, crayons are a lot like gelatos. And then I know there's watercolor pencils out there too. I didn't talk about that much in my class. Does anybody want to know about watercolor pencils? Um, I still have some in my stash, so I want to know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Emma says I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let me let me go grab them and I'll be right back. Okay. Well, I will show stuff while we're doing this because I brought up all these things that I could showcase. Um so I have different things using these same techniques that I've done on some of my pages. So just blending the different colors with this one. I don't know if you can see that little bit of shiny, the gold shininess on that page. That was just a little bit of Heidi shine swapped on there. It wasn't fully dry in the background. I'm like, what's it going to do? It turned out like super pretty. It's pretty subtle because I did it like gold onto the yellow for the most part. You can see a little bit more of it down here, but it was just trying it. Worst case that happens, I don't like it in the end and I cut it up and I throw it onto some cards or I throw it onto something else and I don't turn it into uh, a scrapbook page. Um, got a little bit of watercolor in here and I used a little bit of a stencil to, I think I laid the stencil down and then I pulled color off of it with a, with a paper towel just because mm -hmm. You know, that's a fun thing to do. Like, oh, yeah. yeah, that's actually a technique called lifting. 
There we go. Let's see. I've got. I did something technical without knowing. <laughs> you did. Yes. So you can like wet a paper towel and put it down wherever your dry paint gets wet again. And this is going to depend a little bit on the brand of paint and the color of paint because some some pigments are more stubborn than other pigments. But wherever your dry paint gets wet. And I like to have a tissue. I had a tissue. Let's see. Nope. Let me grab another one. Wherever your paint gets wet, it's going to reactivate the paint and you can lift that color back off. So I'm going to give myself some stripes here by lifting off this color. Cool. Jackie's asking, can you stamp over the painted areas after they're dry? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It shouldn't be any problem. It, it, like you can use water-based ink, you can use uh, pigment ink. It, it should be fine. Yeah, whatever you use. Other thing, like when those when I showed those little journals with the stamps and stuff, I take my um, Gina K amalgam ink. It's black amalgam ink. Sorry, I'm not on this on the screen here. Um, this ink, you can watercolor over it. You can kind of do anything you want when you have this Gina K amalgam ink. I think it's magic ink because it doesn't bleed and it doesn't spread. <laughs> so yeah. like you can't stamp it onto something wet and expect right. it to stay. Right. But if, if you're stamping onto the dry thing, mm -hmm. let this dry for a little bit and then you can watercolor yep. ink. I, I haven't found something I could use on it that made it bleed. So mm -hmm. it's kind of amazing. Yeah, I have, I do, I do like the Gina K. I've started playing with it. Um, but for just watercoloring, I also like VersaFine. Now this one isn't going to work for Copics or anything like that. But if you want something specifically for water, the VersaFine is nice too. I get very crisp stamped images with this one. All right, any other questions? Uh, oh, have... We're talking about watercolor pencils. Yeah, okay. Um... Before we do that, before we talk about the pencils, because that'll start okay. a whole new thing. Yep. Can you talk to us about overworking paper? Because I've totally done that. And how do you kind of prevent doing it? Um, I ended up still using my overworked paper because I'm like, eh, I made it. But then, you know, I did other things to kind of hide the stuff. Like this background where the hearts are, like the hearts are actually overlaid over top of the watercolor paper in the background but i had definitely overworked the paper and it got like mm, yucky so tips like on pilly. preventing that from happening um if you're using an actual watercolor paper you're way less likely to have that happen to you i have never overworked watercolor paper i have overworked cardstock and the amount of water you use combined with how many swipes you make across a piece of cardstock is what overworking is. And if you're doing a lot of it on cardstock, you're going to get the paper starts to disintegrate and it'll peel up on you. Mm -hmm. But I haven't had that problem with watercolor paper. I just, I just don't tend to, to be too rough with it, I suppose. I think I was being like, oh, I don't know if that's quite right. And then I just kept going. I had a lot of water. Yeah. I guess lot. the other thing is if you're not happy with something, you can let it dry and come back to it and do some lifting or add some more color on top of it. If, if your paper has a chance to dry out in between, you're going to have less of a problem with that as well. Cool. Okay. Tell us all about pencils. Okay. Pencils. Um, watercolor pencils are, this is my set. It's from Stampin' Up! from years and years ago. I have the um, same ones. <laughs> yeah, they're very fun. I, I do have a little swatch here that I played with. So watercolor pencils are interesting because you can use them as a colored pencil where you can just add some color in there to your paper. And I'll move this out because it's a little distracting on the um, You can just, you know, add color in here. But if you want to watercolor once you've scribbled, um, you should know that watercolor pencils will leave behind some of that scribble texture. You can see that I'm picking up some of the color, but in the background, you've still got that texture behind there. Let's see if I can hold it up a little bit more. So you're gonna see your scribble. So a couple things that you can do, I will create myself a palette. So I will just scribble dark shades of water of pencil let's get some purple 
onto a piece of cardstock or watercolor paper. And then I'll use that as my paint palette. So I will come in and pick up some of the color and then I can bring it over here and start painting with it if you don't want to get that texture. Now the lighter, the lighter of a hand that you use with the pencils, the less likely you will be to leave that texture behind. So that one's going to blend just a little bit better for me, but that's some of the things about watercolor pencils. And these are fun with stamps too, if you like to stamp, because you can, I do have a stamp actually. So you had told us during the actual class that we did, we talked about pencils and how like if you want to use a pencil to sketch up, don't put your watercolor over top of your pencil marks because then you cannot remove them. Yeah. Um, so is this a little bit the same as that or it blends in a little bit better um, with colors or? Well, actual pencils are graphite and watercolor pencils, I don't know what they're made out of, but I think it's something about the tooth of the paper that kind of holds on to the pigment. There might be like a waxy element also in the watercolor pencils that is harder to dissolve. Those are my guesses, but that's just a guess. <laughs> And if we're going back to the, the pencil here, I did put pencil marks on my frame. Let's see if we can, yeah, we can see them. So I did put pencil marks on my frame and I will try to keep those marks either where they're gonna be covered up or not painted. Now this one I painted over the top, but this one I didn't. So as long as your paper is dry enough, you can erase that pencil. Now let's see what happens over here. So I got some of the pencil, but I don't know if it'll show up on camera. Some of the pencil that, eh, I'm not seeing it. Are you guys seeing it at all? Some of the pencil that was underneath the paint stayed behind. So if you're gonna see a pencil mark, like if I were to draw a circle and then I started painting, inside my circle, I would try to come up close to that pencil line instead of going over the top of it. That way I can erase my circle later. Um, and I do that, I usually use a, a die set that's a circle die set to draw nice perfect circles and I'll trace around it with my pencil to get nice circle shapes. <laughs> Uh, I don't think that, like, I think that some people can draw circles, but I think the rest of us are drawing, you know, circle-ish shapes. Circle-ish, yeah, I usually get circle-ish when I'm not, when I'm not worried about it, but if I want true circles, like I did some Christmas cards one year that were Christmas ornaments, and I really wanted them to be nice and circular, so I did draw pencil lines around some dies and got a nice shape. Did you want to tell us a little bit about what you're doing on your YouTube channel this year? You kind of have an introduction sure. video on your channel, but tell us anyways. Yeah. And uh, that way we kind of know what you're what you're doing there and where we can find more inspiration from you. Sure. Um, I started my YouTube channel about two years ago, and in the beginning, it was just for me. It was just for fun to learn, and then the pandemic hit. <laughs> I was like, well, I'm home a lot, so I started putting a little more energy into my channel, and I found that I really like it. I really enjoy the process of editing video and filming, and I'm enjoying the comments that people leave for me, so the interaction with people. So this year, I decided to kind of up my game again. <laughs> So I've got videos coming out about three times a week. Um, I do have a whole schedule on my blog that lists what I've got going on. So I do kit building. I do um, product play experimentation. Um, in February, I'm going to be playing with um, embroidery floss and different ways to add it to scrapbooking and cards. Um, I'm doing mixed media once a month. It might often be watercolor, but sometimes it'll be other mixed media stuff. I do uh, process layout process videos. Let's see, what else have I got going on? I do get one kit of uh, crafty supplies in the mail. So I do an unboxing and then a project with that. I've got, oh, one of my series is 
fun to me. Hopefully it's fun to other people, but I'm a fan of the cooking show called Chopped. I don't know if anybody knows that one, but on the show, they get a basket of mystery ingredients. So I bought a random mystery box of craft supplies and I will pull out, <clears throat> excuse me, I will pull out three things from my box and then have to make a project with it. So I find that really, it's really fun for me to do. Hopefully it's fun for people to watch. <laughs> so yeah, I've got a lot of stuff going on over there. Right now. Do you wanna, what was that? You want to switch your camera angles to back to like your your face so we can see you. Yep. Sorry, I should have had you do that before we yep. talk in there. Candace says she loves that. <laughs> I think there we go. it's such a good idea, right? To, um, to kind of get you playing with stuff. It's like, forced kind of creativity right and yeah, I, I think th the funnest thing I did was I got one of those enamel pins in the box and I was like what do I do with enamel pin I turned it into a stamp I stamped it with um embossing ink and I used it as a stamp <laughs> it was <laughs> it's just fun because you don't know what you're going to get and what you can figure out and let your mind go crazy I would so be breaking the little pins off the back and using it as an embellishment. Uh -uh. Yeah, that was the obvious choice, but I had to make it more complicated. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So your YouTube channel is called Crafty Soup Video. Yes. And... So my blog is Crafty Soup. And so the rest of my life has Crafty Soup something with it. So Crafty Soup Video on YouTube and Crafty Soup Picks on Instagram, P-I-C-S. Perfect. Yeah, so please take time and follow Misty there. I wanted to thank everyone for joining us for this extra bonus session. I enjoyed your class so much. You can tell from the pages that I'm making that playing with watercolor is super fun for me, right? Like it just, you know, I've even tried doing a little sketching. That kind of looks like a whale. I was really it, proud it of it. It looks like a whale. I can totally <laughs> like, recognize it. You could tell what it was and everything. But, um, you know, not everything turns out like that as you start and play. So I keep like a whole stack of things. And I just wanted to share this at the end to say, like, don't be scared of starting. Here is like a really questionable piece of art. Like those flowers are bad they just are but look how nice the vase is here, and look I've at got my, my questionable art and, also. <laughs> and look at my shadowing down here so like even in the struggle there are little wins that we take away we learn things as we go mm -hmm. I did a whole series of little tiny cards where I just did different things and tried different things and I would look at different um images online and try to try to copy somebody else's watercolor. Don't put it side by side to the original because that's horrible. But like <laughs> compare my own to like the process that I've gone through to kind of get here. And it's so much better than, you know, what you think. You know, you learn as you play. So take the time to play and create and have the fun. Mm -hmm. And I think that that will, you know, just inspire you to to try new things, have fun when you're making and make some pages that you love, which, you know, that's my big goal. Yeah. And if we didn't get anything covered today that you had questions about, reach out to me. I'll answer your questions. So you can, probably the best place to reach out to me is on Instagram because I tend to be able to easily catch those messages as they come in. That's awesome. So Diane says, good class, Misty. I learned something. Thanks, Alice, for scheduling this. And if you were not part of the Scrap Smarter experience, like I said, the whole replay for the event is going to be available probably tomorrow. Like I said, I was going to be today. Stuff, stuff didn't work out today, but um, I should be available tomorrow. And then probably a week or so after that, the individual classes will be on sale. So we will, you would be able to get access to Misty's watercolor play class where she takes you through all of the supplies, all of the techniques. She builds that wonderful page that we saw in the beginning in her little preview video. And I just think that would be a really fun thing if you missed out on that. And if you didn't miss out, you have access, all those replays are available. You have access for 18 months. So you have plenty of time to review. You can stop, pause, check it out, be like, oh my gosh, I need to order this thing so that I can do some of this. Or like literally, um, 
I think I got this from Walmart. That's that Strathmore paper. Pretty sure yep. it was from Walmart. Yep. <laughs> so they're they're readily available. They are, yes. Awesome. Marcia says, thanks, Allison Misty. Jackie says, thanks, Alice. This was great. I love colors and this is a very good outlay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for the bone, the fun bonus time. Yeah. Awesome. I like to play, so I'm happy to be here. <laughs> so much, everyone. Check out Misty's channel. And if you want to connect more with me, pop over to scraphappy.org or find me on Instagram at Alice Bowl. And I'd love to connect and do some fun stuff. Speaking of fun stuff, I would be bad if I did not say we have our load challenge coming up. This is the Fresh, Simple, and Shiplap a load challenge. We are going to be scrapbooking the whole month of December, February. December is over. Thank goodness. <laughs> I can't even believe I said that. Uh, the whole month of February inspired by Chip and Joanna Gaines from Fixer Upper. And we are going to be using inspiration from their stories, their business, their ideas, their life to help us tell our own stories. And of course, we're going to explore the fresh, simple uh, styles that Joanna has and probably figure out exactly what shiplap is and why she loves it so much. So that is going to be a thing that we do as well. And you can check that out at scraphappy.org slash load. So thank you for the bonus. It was great. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that we had a chance to do this today. This was fun. Bye everyone. All right. Bye everybody.